This is about a 75-year-old chap presents with two nasty, large RCCs. And uh, about two weeks later, Tim renders his, that's the same cut, uh, looking like that. So uh, I'd just like to uh, start by asking Professor Hawkins to uh, tell us about whether everyone is a candidate. Right, thank, thanks very much for the invite. It's a great pleasure to, to be here to talk to a whole group of, group of surgeons. I'm... Uh, very enthusiastic about rendering patients free of disease myself, so we're, we've got a lot in, in common there. So um, the first question is, is, is everyone with metastatic clear cell renal carcinoma a candidate for a TKI? As you know, there have been a lot of uh, new drugs developed over the last uh, few years. They've developed in, in rapid succession, and many of them have been TKIs, but, but not, not all. And they've all been licensed. They're not all uh, nice, nice approved. And, and so how do we choose uh, these drugs, and should everybody get a TKI? Uh, and is, is there a role for interleukin-2 interferon are the questions I'm going to answer. I suppose one issue is that a, a group of poor prognosis patients were uh, picked upon for, uh, for trials with uh, an mTOR inhibitor, uh, Temsorolimus, and that showed a, 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 an overall uh, survival benefit, albeit a modest uh, benefit, for patients with uh, poor prognosis. So that would be one group we would not necessarily uh, pick a TKI for. There's um, a whole, uh, but when you look at the actual use of TKIs, this is the uh, sunitinib uh, study where patients were stratified by different uh, risk factors. They were mostly supposed to have uh, good or intermediate risk factors, but a few had poor prognostic factors. And there was indeed still a small benefit to uh, treatment. None of, it was not statistically significant in view of the, the small numbers, but there did appear to still be a benefit. So you could make a case for such patients having either treatment, and there's obvious, uh, obvious overlap between the, the two groups. So this is one, one case. This is a, a patient, a relatively young patient, patient with uh, metastatic uh, renal cancer. He presented with very small volume lung metastases, tiny almost, uh, but a large renal primary. It was excised. Uh, it was a clear cell tumor, but there was very, very extensive sarcomatoid change, and he was referred fairly soon after surgery for treatment of his lung metastases. By the time he got to us, he was short of breath, uh, getting uh, generally unwell. He had multiple uh, lung metastases, quite sizable by that time. He'd already got a local uh, recurrence by that time. Uh, and he was, uh, it was clearly going downhill fairly quickly. Uh, at that time, we didn't have much choice about uh, what treatment we gave, and he was uh, commenced on uh, sunitinib as it being the only licensed treatment, uh, or NICE approved. He was kind of borderline NICE, I guess you'd say, but he was uh, acceptable. He started on treatment. I warned him that he wouldn't respond. There's a lot of data that patients with more than 20% sarcomatoid features don't respond to treatment, but in fact, he, he did. Uh, so when he came back three weeks later, he was actually feeling uh, a lot better. But very shortly after, uh, he had a further follow-up scan. He was deteriorating. And within three months, he was uh, very breathless, bilateral pleural effusions, a massive growth of his local recurrence. Uh, he switched to Temsorolimus, an mTOR inhibitor, and that was no better, and he was dead within uh, six months of treatment. So that's uh, a fairly... Uh, typical story with the sarcomatoid patients and, and uh, TKIs and other modern therapies have not made a great deal of difference, I would say, to most of those. There's a whole range of patients who we wouldn't treat with TKIs. We probably would treat the patient that you first uh, put up. Uh, we would be a bit cautious about the dose uh, in terms of uh, patients on dialysis, but they generally seem to tolerate it uh, reasonably well, although obviously the overall outcome tends to be uh, worse. I guess patients with severe or active cardiovascular disease we'd, we'd worry about. We have a lot of problems with uh, ischemic ulcers in our, in our clinics that worsen, and we're quite worried about that. I've illustrated the issue of poor prognosis patients, whether mTOR uh, drugs may be better than TKIs for those, uh, particularly when there's sarcomatoid change and you'll hear about the uh, non-clear cell patients uh, later. So um, 
sounds like uh, most people are, are in, in field for this, uh, the sort of population we're going to be uh, looking at. Um, how about the old drugs, interferon, alpha, interleukin? Um, this is a, a high-performance guy, he's about 55, had a lapnophrectomy three, four years ago, and then presented with four or five relatively small volume lung mets and um, came to us seeing what, uh, what treatments he could be offered. Okay, thanks very much. So I guess with multiple lung mets, he's going to be not a, a certain immediate surgical candidate at any rate. And this is a, another patient. So I'm just going to tell you a story about th this patient. So this, this patient uh, came to a clinic uh, a couple of years ago. He saw the registrar, and the registrar said, uh, you know, a young patient, uh, multiple uh, lung metastases, quite some time after surgery, three years after surgery, had a relatively low-grade tumor but was beginning to get symptomatic in spite of being young and, and very fit. He thought he needed to exercise more when he got uh, well. So this is, again, the same uh, slide. So the registrar says, well, you know, great, we've got great new drugs there. They're brilliant. Uh, you're in the favorable uh, risk group now. And look, um, your uh, progression-free survival is, is nearly, nearly double. That's uh, really great. These are a great advance. Uh, these drugs. So he says, oh, that's, uh, that's great. So I suppose that means uh, I'll live a lot longer. So this is the same trial, and this, this is the overall uh, survival of patients either with interferon or with sunitinib, and there's basically no difference, but if anything, is slightly in favor of interferon. Well, there isn't obviously a difference, but it's a very complicated trial, and there was a lot of crossing between drugs, so it's hard to interpret how much the benefit is uh, overall. He says, uh, okay, so what can you achieve in the, in the long term? How long, does it, uh, how long does the benefit last? And uh, what are the other measurements of how it works? So he says, well, I don't know, but we've done an audit uh, of uh, all our patients on TKIs, and about 40% uh, of them respond substantially. Uh, many of them are on treatment for quite some time, and if you take all comers, then about uh, the average survival is about uh, two years. But when you look at the long-term survival, this is a six-year follow-up uh, curve. Unfortunately, it's very poor. There's only a very low uh, percentage who are alive uh, more than five years uh, after treatment. This does include all patients. If you take the best prognosis patients, it's better. The worst prognosis patients, it's worse. So that's the overall uh, average with patients treated with uh, TKIs. So he says, well, that's, that's, that's really disappointing. I, I've got young children, I want to see them uh, grow up. I met somebody outside who said, uh, there's a, you know, I had a treatment eight years ago, you've only got lung metastases, you don't need to worry, that's not uh, a problem. Uh, so he said, isn't there, a, isn't, there anything, isn't there anything else? So he said, well, there is a very toxic regime, uh, high dose interleukin-2. And that, that's given uh, like this, where patients are given uh, treatment intravenously in hospital as opposed to orally as an, out, as an outpatient. And they're in the hospital for uh, 10 days out of, every, out of three weeks, repeated uh, three monthly. And there are a lot of side effects from treatment. This is what happens. Uh, you develop uh, fevers, uh, rigors immediately after the treatment. You need to be given fluid to uh, maintain the blood pressure. And this treatment is repeated every, every eight to 10 hours for a period of a week, and then again uh, after a week's rest. So it's pretty unpleasant, uh, but uh, uh, that's, that's, what, that's what it is. So the reason this treatment has been around is that it's only the only uh, potentially curative treatment for uh, metastatic renal cancer. It is complex, and it is uh, toxic, but overall about 10% of patients achieve a complete remission. He says, well, that doesn't really sound that good either. So what so we've been looking at is whether you can uh, select patients for uh, treatment. And we've looked at patients based on their histology. And with, a good, with the right type of histology, uh, you can get about 50% of patients respond, and about half of those have complete remissions. And this is the uh, similar long-term outcome. It's a slightly longer scale here. But there, basically, about 30% of patients have uh, long-term survival compared with uh, less than 10% in the other uh, type of treatment. Clearly, that's not quite a fair, a fair comparison, but that's the general gist of it.
So he says, well, do I fit those criteria? And those are just, you have to be under, under 70, uh, reasonably fit, no cardiovascular problems, and willing to have what is a, definitely a toxic treatment. The type of histology is basically just a classical uh, clear cell uh, renal carcinoma with alveolar uh, features uh, predominating. And that's exactly what he had. So this is a typical alveolar clear cell renal uh, cancer with very nice nests of, of cells. He did have multiple right, rather larger lung metastases than we probably would have liked, but he, he, after three cycles, he had a really, really good response. But there were clearly tumors left, so he had about 25 lung mets originally. He had about eight after, after three cycles of treatment. They were, eight were excised, which is quite unusual, and surprisingly, they all showed completely uh, necrotic uh, nodules with loads of inflammatory cells around them, presumably T cells that were uh, activated by the interleukin-2. So he, he's now been in remission for uh, quite some time. So overall, I would say interferon is now hardly ever used, except in conjunction with Avastin, obviously. It possibly should be used in selected patients, but we don't know who they are, uh, and, and so it is really very rarely used. High-dose interleukin-2, there is no absolute proof that it's uh, beneficial, but uh, it does offer the real, uh, be real chance of long-term benefit in a significant group of patients if you uh, select them carefully. And so I would say it should be considered for those carefully selected patients. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So we, uh, most people can have them. And uh, for the very high performance people, they still do very well with IL-2. But we've... How many patients a year are you treating with IL-2? <coughs> About 20. 20. So at any one time, 5% of all patients on treatment having a low number. Should it become a standard? Because these are potentially curable, to, even though it's 10%, it's a lot. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure. Um, we, we've looked at our series, and it's not an absolute test. There are some with, there's certainly a trend towards those with high expression doing better. But there are some with low expression who do, uh, do respond very well. Uh, and we're looking at the actual, the, polymorphisms in the gene, and that might actually be more important than the expression level, I think. Great. So we, we, we hadn't anticipated that you were going to show such quite spectacular <laughs> slides as that, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on with a question on the, uh, the, the new life-prolonging, but not, possibly not life-curing agents. And uh, I'm just going to ask Tom Powell to come and tell us about, we've got all these drugs. Um, who, who responds to which drug? We've got a case here of somebody who's been on all three, um, uh, and then we'll, we'll look on to when we should use them, in which order. Thank you very much for asking me to come along. So um, the issue is, can we identify which patients respond to targeted therapy? Uh, and I'm afraid the answer is no, we don't. It's complete guesswork. And this is maybe the biggest challenge that we have at the moment. Because let's not forget, although these drugs work very well, they are actually toxic. And putting someone on a toxic drug with a limited life expectancy that's not going to do them any benefit is clearly in nobody's interest. This curve here is the Kaplan-Meier curve. And it's actually looking at overall survival on this curve here. And it's comparing patients who receive sunitinib therapy. And if you have progression on sunitinib therapy, your cancer grows. This is only about 10% of patients. Yes, you do badly. But for the others, those with stable disease or a partial response, the outcome for the other 80% is the same. So when the patient comes back after two months of therapy and they've had a response, you can't put your hand on your heart and say, that's good news. Because these patients are doing no better than the stable patients. So what that basically means is we set patients out on a journey and we say, you're going to take this drug once a day and we're going to keep going until the music stops. Um, worse than that, you would think that if you did well on the first drug that you have, does that mean you're going to do well on the second drug you're going to have as well? And logic dictates if you do well in the first group, you do well with the second drug. I'm afraid that's not the case because you can see here, this is progression on first-line therapy time and progression on second-line therapy. And you can see this guy here did incredibly well on first-line therapy, but very badly on second-line therapy. 
and vice versa. And so not only can we not tell who's going to do well at the beginning, but even once you've done well or badly on your first drug, you can't tell how you're going to do on the second drug. And this is a real problem for us. So it really is a case of what we do and what we don't know, and I'm afraid I'd like to pretend the curve was the other way around, but it's not. How do we take this forward in the future? Well, there are various ways that we can take this forward without looking at CT specifically. So we can take plasma from patients, we can take their tissue, and we can perform functional imaging like MRI and, D and, 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 and uh, FDG PET. To go through those three individually, yes, there's been some work performed. No, none of it is conclusive at the moment. And it's all hypothesis generating work rather than work that we actually need to be taking forward in the clinical setting. What we can do from patients is we can take out host factors, so we can take out germline material from the plasma, and we can look at single nucleotide polymorphisms to specific um, um, genes, and we can identify that some drugs seem to work better in patients with specific polymorphisms to their germline. And so what this is suggesting to us is there are host factors which predict response to these drugs. We can also take the other bit from the plasma and look at growth factors such as VEGF or other growth factors potentially to see if they correlate with outcome. Currently, this second approach has been less successful. And if, in fact, you're going to pick one of the two, the further investigation of these single nucleotide polymorphisms in the host it actually looks very promising. The second issue is tissue. And we always talk about taking tissue, and we talk about looking at gene expression from tissue. And there are lots of different tests that we can perform. And indeed, this is work that was performed at ASCO last year in a relatively small cohort of patients. And from 20 patients, you can identify specific genes associated with response and resistance. And it may be in the future that we can take a biopsy, look for a specific gene, gene expression, and predict the outcome of the patients, but also which drug they have. We are a long, long way from there at the moment, and there are various reasons which make it even more complicated. Firstly, we're using a lot of frozen tissue at the moment, but clearly paraffin tissue has to be used in the day-to-day -day setting. Secondly, these results are not validated, or even we don't even know if they're reproducible. And one of my major concerns is there's a lot of tumor heterogeneity in these renal tumor biopsies. And my fear is you take a biopsy from one area, and it may actually not correspond what's really happening in the cancer, not only in the kidney, but in the metastasis as well. Um, and one of the things that we're doing uh, in our group and around the UK is we are actually looking at sequential tissue. So instead of taking just one biopsy, we're taking sequential biopsies, one at baseline and one after 12 weeks of posopinib therapy is a trial that we're performing at the moment. And the key to this is can we identify biomarkers from sequential tissue, not just from the baseline tissue? And are dynamic changes in biomarkers, this is a before therapy and this is after therapy, and you can see there's a lot of necrosis has developed, but are there molecular markers that we can identify from this tissue that are associated with response and resistance? The third and final area I'm going to talk about, which I think is promising, is whether or not we can look at functional imaging um, to identify patients who respond early to therapy. This first picture here is an FDG PET scan of a chest before therapy, and this is after therapy, and you can, this is after sunitinib therapy, and it's only four weeks of sunitinib, and you can see that this very bright area here represents intense SUV uptake and a very metabolically active tumor, and you can see after only four weeks of therapy, you can turn this tumor off with drugs like sunitinib and pazopinib. The key is, does this turning off process correlate with outcome. And I'm afraid the initial results suggest that that's not the case, in that these early metabolic responses are not correlating with outcome. And this is really problematic. A second group from France has used DC ultrasound scan. Basically, what you need to know about this is it looks at the intensity of the vasculature in the tumor. And these results are actually more promising. And you can see after a month of therapy, there is a reduction in those patients that have a reduction in their vasculature. Those patients do significantly better in terms of their progression-free survival than the remaining patients. So that, uh, currently, the functional imaging data is very mixed. So in conclusion, we've got a real problem with the standard radiological techniques that we're using, and they're not proving helpful. Um, functional imaging is proving to be more complicated than we original thought, originally thought with mixed, res with mixed results. 
The plasma biomarkers are interesting in as much as we've got some early data with SNPs suggesting host polymorphisms may predict response to specific drugs, which is exciting. And we've got a real challenge with tumour samples, not just about tumour heterogeneity, but the way we collect and the way we store these samples. Um, that's all I'd like to say. Tom, thank you very much. Brilliant. Lots, lots of exciting work there. So we're looking into, into who responds to which drug. But to start with, um, how about what order should we go for it? What is, what is the current batting order? We've just got a case here of a, somebody with a, um, a metastatic RCC, and uh, they're coming to you in the clinic. And uh, what are you going to use first? Simon. Thank you, Ben. And uh, I think Ben should be congratulated on getting the slides together from four medical oncologists in order and in such a, such a precise way. Really is like herding cats. So well done to Ben. And uh, thanks to Tim and the organizers for, for inviting me today. So last night, for those of you that were at dinner, it was very illuminating for me. I was sat next to Declan Carhill, who often uh, educates and encourages me. And, and Declan said, well, it must be pretty straightforward. This just roll a dice. Don't try and pretend it's anything else. You just roll a dice. So there may be something in that, but what I'm hoping to say is that there's a little bit of evidence behind the dice roll and hopefully some pragmatism and a pragmatic approach to what we do. So uh, we have several new agents now available for the treatment of, of metastatic kidney cancer. Most of those have been developed in clear cell kidney cancer, and I'm going to talk, touch on non-clear cell. So this talk is really thinking about clear cell. Those agents split themselves into VEGF-targeted therapy, mTOR therapy, uh, cytokine therapy, as Robert touched upon, an observation. And as someone who does a clinic with Tim and Ben, I very much enjoy the role of a medical oncologist astutely observing patients while they go about their work. So <laughs> if we look at uh, treatment algorithms for 2011, this is the sort of diagrams that are put up at each of the big oncology meetings. And hopefully you can see here some of the complexities in terms of first-line treatment, second-line treatment, and how we use these drugs, and various categories of evidence to, to hopefully guide our therapy. And we can see that for first-line therapy in good risk or intermediate risk uh, patients, this, uh, this box here, the main treatments that we tend to use, excluding cytokine therapy for the moment, are sunitinib or pozopilib in this country, and in some areas, interferon and bevacizumab, which is a slightly more complicated way of, of giving drugs with what seems to be very similar, similar outcomes. If we move on to actually thinking about order of treatment, we're now in an age where we do have evidence for second-line treatments. And we can see that with prior cytokine therapy, in some ways this is very much prior interferon-based treatment, there are various agents that have a level of evidence supporting them. What's potentially more, more relevant to what we do day to day is people who've received prior VEGF-targeted therapy. And there's level one evidence to support everolimus, an mTOR inhibitor in this setting, and more recently, axitinib. So we, do, we are suddenly entering an era of choices in what we can do for our patients. But as we know, renal cell carcinoma is very heterogeneous. We know that both on the biological level, but also histologically. And as I say, a lot of the data that we talk about is related to clear cell, and it's important we don't forget that. Prior therapy status is very important. So what patients have received before, the number of prior regimens, whether that's been a VEGF TKI, a cytokine, or an mTOR inhibitor, the response to that treatment, and what toxicities they may have had. So is there an optimal sequence of drugs? So I must have been listening to Declan when I wrote this slide and said there's no data to support this. Well, I think actually there is data to support this. We know that sinitinib's better than interferon, so we know that that's a, a more valid first-line treatment. We know the same for pozopinib. We also know that there's data to support everolimus or axisinib after tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So we do have data to support what we're doing. What we don't have in this, in, this, in this arena where we have lots of new drugs coming through is head-to-head -head trials of the new drugs, and that's really what we're hoping to see. So there are first-line head-to-head studies which I think are important. There's the COMPARE study, which many of, us have, many of you and many of us have taken part in, of pazopinib versus sinitinib, our first-line tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which will hopefully nail down which one of those we should be using first-line. And there are also other intriguing studies, such as using mTOR inhibitors first and then switching to a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And I think those are going to be relevant to many patients. But a lot of the data that we use in terms of new agents is retrospective or from small studies. So there are lots of questions that I think need to be answered, and these are the ones that, sort of, that we pose in our clinical practices. 
As Tom touched on, what should, what should we do in patients who progress on tyrosine kinase inhibitors? Should they receive another tyrosine kinase inhibitor? Should they be switched to an mTOR inhibitor? Does it really matter if there was a benefit to the first tyrosine kinase inhibitor? Do we really need more tyrosine kinase inhibitors, more mTOR inhibitors, or actually do we need a new target, a better target for people failing those? And what about patients who have received adjuvant therapy? There are very, very important adjuvant trials taking part in the UK. Many of our patients are going into that, and we don't really know what, what effect that will have on later th systemic therapy for those patients who relapse. So what do we actually do? This is something that Tim was very keen to get across. What do you actually do? So that what do we actually do in our practice? We do clinical trials in both the adjuvant and the neoadjuvant setting with first-line trials and second-line trials. A first-line standard therapy for us is sunitinib. Second line, we're looking at clinical trials. We've just been involved in the COSAC trial, which Tom led, which was looking at another tyrosine kinase inhibitor. An interesting biologically, plus or minus a SARC inhibitor that may overcome VEGF resistance. So answering a very relevant clinically biological question. In, the, in, in England, we have access to Everolimus through the Cancer Drugs Fund, but that isn't true in the rest of the UK. And axitinib is just about to be available through an access scheme through, from Pfizer. Third line, and it seems strange now these days when less than five years ago we only had interferon for these patients, we're thinking about using Everolimus, where again there is level one evidence to support the use after two, two, two lines of tyrosine kinase inhibition. So that's what we do. So in conclusion, in terms of order of, of drugs, several new agents that have become available. Optimal sequence does remain to be determined in terms of the new agents. I think VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors for the majority of patients, with some important exceptions, is a first-line therapy. But we really do need those markers to identify which patients and which drug. At the moment, giving the same drug to the whole host of patients does feel very unsatisfactory. And I think going back to observation, we need to be very careful about the initiation of drugs. These drugs are toxic, they're expensive. We need to make sure that we're initiating for the right reasons and that we're monitoring them closely. So thank you for that, that part. So I'm, I'm going straight for this, this case was a case who came to our kidney cancer clinic, uh, a young man, a sailor, who developed hematuria and had sort of found, him, found his way to guys from Southampton. He had a large supraclavicular lymph node mass, uh, a large renal primary that was bleeding, and large periotic lymphadenopathy. Uh, Tim removed his kidney and his, and his periotic lymph nodes, and then he's gone on to have systemic therapy, um, actually at Adam Brooks, because he's... Uh, He's moving around the country, as you can see. So if we go back to non-clear cell histology, a lot of the data that, that's been touched on so far has been about clear cell histology. So I refer back to my dining companions from yesterday evening and give me more hints for what I was going to talk about tonight. So, so Penny, one of our CNSs, and Declan were trying to be helpful at this stage. And they said, well, non-clear cell, that's easy. The drugs don't work, and you can, you know, that's pretty much it. And, and while Tim had said to be concise, I think he was hoping more than the, for just the one slide. So if we look at renal cell carcinoma, it is a very heterogeneous disease. It's clear cell histology predominates, and it predominates not only as the most common uh, subtype, but it predominates the data that we know about in terms of the targeted therapies. The studies were, were, were designed for these patients, and we mustn't forget that. However, if we look at this WHO classification, you can see there are other important subtypes here which have important disease characteristics, sometimes important genetic abnormalities that perhaps we can target. If we look at where we were, so the outcome to pre-tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapies, and this is a retrospective review from Sloan Kettering done from 1985 to 2005 looking at systemic therapy. One of the things that struck me here was that actually a very small number of patients, and this is, sorry, this is just metastatic papillary carcinoma, but would hold for most of the non-clear cell subtypes. You can see it's only 44 patients. And you can see here that also very, very, well, no responses, one response to a novel agent, and very little stable disease. So these are, 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 are patients that are, that are non-responsive to the classical immunotherapy and to cytotoxic treatments. So if we move to the new agents, and these, these are some of the, the pivotal phase three studies of sinitinib, serafinib, everolimus, etc. Virtually all these studies mandated clear cell histology. The only one that didn't that's highlighted there in green was the temsorolimus mTOR inhibitor study, uh, which Robert talked about briefly. This study allowed non-clear cell, non cell histology. It didn't differentiate between the different types, 
although chatting to the investigators involved with this study, many felt that this was largely papillary, uh, uh, papillary histology. If we look at the patients treated in this, and with the caveats that, uh, important caveats is a relatively small number of patients, so if we look at the 400 patients treated in the Temsolimus versus interferon part of that study, there was a significant benefit for, uh, in non-clear cell histology, and in fact the benefit appeared to be greater than, than the clear cell histology. The very important caveat with that goes back to the previous slide, and in fact interferon is not an active treatment, and so perhaps the benefit is actually exaggerated and I think some people have taken this study to mean that we should be treating all non-clear cell histology with with mTOR inhibitors that's not how I read it I think it just shows that perhaps there's a signal and that these drugs perhaps have some relevance for the, for those tumor types we do have prospective evidence and I think one uh, one area that was was very well done we were part of it as were I know the other investigators here was the expanded access where we looked at what's very much a real-world setting beyond the clinical trials if we concentrate on the, on the study at the bottom, the one, the sunitinib study, which was led by, by Martin Gore from the Royal Marsden, they recruited over 4,000 patients worldwide. That's a huge amount of patients, a huge amount of data. From that, there were over 400 patients with non-clear cell histology. Again, the data wasn't refined enough to, to differenti differentiate by histological subtype, but you can see that there's a, a significant response rate compared to where we were before, a response rate of 11%. The response rate in the total group was 17%, so lower than we see in selected clinical trials. The overall survival of 13 months, better than the 17, 18 months from the, whole, from the whole group, and better than what we saw historically. So some data to support the use of these drugs. This is a, a table that was put up at this year's ASCO saying what we can do for non-clear cell histology. I think the take-home message from this is twofold. One, that collecting duct carcinomas sit aside from from the other cancers, immunohistochemically they're similar to transitional cell carcinomas, so they should be treated with cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy. The other take home is the number of question marks, the number of unanswered questions for these patients. So what do we do with our patients? Well, I must admit non-clear cell histology does leave you a little bit cold because the data doesn't support it as much. I think clinical trials are very important. The source study that Noel talked about yesterday includes high-risk non-clear cell patients. So very important to recruit those into that study. Raptor is a study that some of us have been involved with which, which looks at papillary uh, renal cell carcinoma and the use of the mTOR inhibitor Ebrolimus. It's been a difficult study to recruit to, but it does have tissue associated with it. Outside of that, I think VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors are a reasonable approach, but monitor your careful patients carefully, monitor toxicities carefully. Everolimus, again, I think is a reasonable approach, and we've seen some efficacy for patients with that. But again, be careful with those patients. I think in summary, there is some activity with these agents. That's supported by prospective data from the expanded access program that, that, in, uh, that there are improvements upon the historical data. I think the clear thing is, and this is one thing that James touched upon this morning, if we can learn from other tumor types, take the example of non-small cell lung cancer, which used to be one large mishmash of patients who all got the same chemotherapy. Patients are now being dissected down, even with small genetic abnormalities. And we see something like the CMET abnormalities that we see in papillary type 1. There are now CMET inhibitors. There are specific studies. And hopefully, we'll be clever in the way that we treat these, these tumors in the future. Thank you very much. Simon, that's great. Thank you for that uh, uh, insight in how, how we're going to go forward in this area. Now, Whatever drug we give them, we need to assess how, how well it works. Um, so I'd like to ask Tom back just to tell us about how we assess the response uh, in this situation. Um, this is a patient uh, from Guy's who uh, I wasn't looking after who um, has an area of local disease um, um, which is demonstrated by the arrow here. And you can see as time goes by, this area of disease hasn't changed very much. He's developed no new metastatic disease. And what it highlights, and he has had no systemic therapy. What it highlights to us is that there is a very broad spectrum of patients with metastatic clear cell renal cancer. Uh, on the one hand, um, we just saw the poorest data with Temsirolimus, where patients are usually dead within six months. And the other extreme is this gentleman here, who's not unusual, who's had no systemic therapy, who's living with metastatic disease, and has done so for a number of years. 
And so the issue um, which that raises is do all patients have to start therapy immediately? And the second issue is how do we measure response to therapy? Um, I showed this curve already, and uh, basically the key to this is that the way we measure response is not by assessing progression, because as I said before, um, progression is not particularly helpful up front, and we certainly are not looking at those that respond, because response isn't associated with outcome. What we do is we uh, start systemic therapy, and we wait until the cancer begins to grow. And what we define that is as progression-free survival. Um, and as I said previously, other forms of trying to identify ways of um, early markers, early identification of um, progression have been unsuccessful. So we're stuck with the system which we, we refer to as resist version 1.1, which I, you've probably heard of before but don't know very much about the details of. And basically all that you need to do is to cut a very long story short, and the, the document regarding resist is about 20 pages long. But basically what it does is it looks at each individual metastatic site, or up to five metastatic sites, it adds them all together. So you get a figure between one centimeter and 20 centimeters in terms of the disease burden. And it follows that over a period of time. And if it reduces by 30%, that's defined as a response to therapy. And if it increases by 20%, that is defined as progression. And as soon as a patient hits that progression time, in the clinical trials, patients switch therapy. So it's a very precise measurement. The issue is whether or not it's clinically applicable. This is an interesting curve. This is record one, which compares Everolimus and placebo. And you can see, this is a study which looks at progression-free survival as the primary endpoint. So you look and wait until the cancer grows. And you can see here, this is the placebo arm, and you can see this curve crash down. And what that's telling us is at this two-month time point, when the scan was done, according to the trial, over the half of the patients are progressing. And you can see this stepwise approach occurring with this trial. And the reason these steps are there is it mandates in the clinical trial that you're doing these scans on a two-monthly basis which is why you get this stepwise approach. And this has been driving us clinically as well. So when we hit progression, we like to switch therapy. The question is, is that the right thing to do? This is a, obviously these are not really blue tumors. This is a curve, uh, these are, these are uh, slides I made myself. And I think the issue with this slide is it, 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 it's gonna demonstrate how difficult it is to actually interpret resist progression. So this is patient one with a yellow tumor. All these patients are starting with the same size tumor at the same, uh, at this baseline, and two months and at four months. And you can see there's been a partial response, 30% reduction, and then progression of this disease, which is a 20% increase. But you can see this tumor here is still smaller than the original tumor. And this is not an unusual situation that we see in medical oncology. And their second patient here, as the patient I showed at the beginning, has just continued on therapy throughout. He never had this response but he hasn't actually hit progression either. So this patient would continue on therapy, although this individual who initially had a response would have switched. And then we've got this third patient here at the bottom who actually has got stable disease, who's had a small response at uh, four months, but has developed a liver metastasis. And this patient has had a mixed response. Some areas are smaller and some areas are bigger, and indeed he's got new areas as well. This would hit a definition of progression because of a new site of disease. But actually, is this patient and this patient and this patient, do they have identical outcomes? No, of course they do, don't. But are we using the same method to assess their outcome? Yes, we are. So the situation is very accurate and precise, very good for clinical trials, but probably isn't very good for a clinical setting. And this, calm, this um, slide here is a slide which um, I think is becoming more and more popular. And what it's suggesting to us is this theory about keeping calm and carrying on. So if you do have one isolated new lung metastasis, do you have to switch therapy immediately? Should you stop therapy? And the question here is it's not all about the CT scan, it's about the patient as well. And if the patient has had a, a benefit from targeted therapy and continues with no systematic progression of disease, so symptomatically they're the same, but actually has a mixed response to therapy, there is an argument about continuing beyond, beyond resist progression. Because remember, when you switch to second or third line therapy, one can't with NICE go back and use those drugs again. 
And so we are really getting one shot with targeted therapy with each individual agent. And the argument that I'm having at the moment is whether or not we should be squeezing as much as we can out of these individual agents. So, in conclusion, progression-free survival measured by RESIST is a very precise and accurate tool, a very good way of comparing drugs, but actually it's not necessarily a very good way of determining clinical benefit. The definition of progression of disease incorporates that heterogeneous group of those three patients who I demonstrated with the three different colored tumors. Um, the outcome from a precise resist progression may be the same, but the clinical outcome is likely to be very different from one another. I believe it's resulted in a culture of switching drugs early, and it may be that we're not getting the maximum out of the best drugs that we have. One of the things I haven't talked about is whether or not progression after first-line therapy means the same as progression after second or third-line therapy. And it's very unlikely that this is the case because we know as the tumours change, it's likely that their response to therapy changes as well. And this is the last controversial point, which is switching away from the most active agents to less active agents, potentially, which we may see in the future, may actually turn out to be counterproductive. Thank you very much indeed. Tom, that was absolutely fantastic. I'd, I wish I'd spoken to you and give, got a, your summary of the recess criteria before I struggled through the 20 pages last night. Um, <laughs> could I um, now ask uh, James Larkin to come and tell us about a really exciting area, which is uh, what lessons can we gain from people who just have tumours melt away? You see a, a tumour here where there's been a really a fantastic response. Are these the ones we should be focusing on? James. Thanks very much indeed, Ben. Um, Thanks for asking me to speak. So you can see a nice response there. And um, this is a patient of ours, actually, which illustrates quite nicely um, something different, but it's something we see in clinical practice, which is the tumour um, you may have seen over a period of about six months. Whilst it hasn't got that much smaller, it's pretty much liquefied, and that's relevant for assessing response as well. So what are the lessons? Um, well, the drugs work really well sometimes, uh, no kidding, um, but so does immunotherapy. Um, but with these drugs, sometimes it can happen, as you've heard already, in poor performance status patients, and immunotherapy doesn't work in those patients, so that's good. All patients, as I said earlier on today, um, become resistant to these drugs, um, no matter how good the initial response. And fundamentally, we have no idea why the drugs work and why they don't work, despite the fact that actually we've almost been using these drugs in clinical trials for 10 years. Um, I think this is pitiful, and I think this is the real lesson that we have to learn. So I would say that the problem um, with treating metastatic or advanced kidney cancer isn't the fact we've got all of these drugs with all these different levels of evidence and this bewildering choice. Um, it's the problem that we don't know which patient to treat with which drug, be it VEGF, mTOR, immunotherapy, cytotoxics, observation even. Um, and therefore the lack of markers of sensitivity and the other side of the coin is the lack of markers of resistance to particular drugs. So um, a slightly stilted list but nevertheless a list of drugs um, licensed to treat cancer in 2011, um, mainly developed in the last 10 years or so. Uh, above the red line, um, drugs used to treat uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, GIST, colorectal cancer, breast and lung cancer. Below the red line, uh, drugs used to treat kidney cancer. Predicted biomarker, I think you know the answer. Yes, above the line, no, below the line. Um, so in kidney cancer, we have no predicted biomarker. So if you imagine um, all of these black faces are, are cancers or tumors, what we use, as you've heard already, um, is histology, type of um, histological subtype, performance status, lines of therapy, uh, classical <coughs> prognostic factors, blood tests, things like that. Um, but if we did have predicted biomarkers, then actually in kidney cancer, we could try and do what um, all our colleagues who treat other types of tumors are doing already, and that's to divide up the patients. Um, and it might be that we can pick out 
um, the one patient out of this group who's going to be an immunotherapy responder and convert that 10% CR rate into a 20% or a 30% or a 40% CR rate because we can select the patient. Um, it might be we can select patients for VEGF or mTOR. And actually, I think quite importantly, and this isn't something that's come up so far in this discussion, 30% of patients, their best response to our treatments first line is progressive disease. So we're not helping them at all. And if we could identify those patients up front and put them into a clinical trial, uh, that would be no bad thing either. So um, I think the advantages are, are self-evident, really. Um, if we have predictive biomarkers in this disease, um, we get bigger uh, benefits from drugs, more efficacy because we're choosing patients rather than being empirical. We get less side effects because the patients are responding while they're on treatment. Uh, I kind of hate to mention money, and I don't at the same time, but actually the qualities are cheaper as well, because if the cost of the drug is the same and the efficacy is greater, uh, it, it will be, the, the health economics will be easier. Um, ultimately, to, de to derive predictive biomarkers, we need to be um, getting tissue, which will allow us to understand the disease better, and we can switch patients not destined to respond. The only disadvantage that I'm aware of, um, and you've heard this from Tom already, is that clinical trials to identify predictive biomarkers are very difficult to do. But I don't think that should put us off. Um, ben? Well, I think we'll, we'll, we'll carry straight through. The, 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 the counter-argument is, uh, is what happens if, if people do have toxicity or for various other reasons, including financial, um, they stop the drugs. This is just a case where... where treat, uh, disease has progressed quite significantly at the point of ceasing. Thanks very much. So, so the question is, um, do the tumours accelerate once the drugs are stopped, which isn't the same thing as do they carry on growing? Do they accelerate? And um, Tom's shown you this already, and it's a, it's a really nice illustration. Um, at the time that this study was uh, designed, uh, the standard treatment... Um, oops, a daisy. don't know what that is. The standard treatment was um, observation, so placebo, um, and the active treatment in this trial was Everolimus. It's the record one trial, and as Tom has shown you already, uh, it's quite spectacular on that first CT scan, um, the number of patients who progress um, immediately. Um, but uh, does that really mean the tumours are accelerating? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think probably uh, the tumour growth might continue at the same speed, as before drug therapy. I don't think we have good evidence that it accelerates. Um, we all know that some patients have flare of symptoms uh, when treatment is stopped. Um, so, for example, the two-week break that you get um, on sunitinib. So sunitinib is given, curiously, a four-week on, two-week off schedule. So during the two-week break, um, some patients um, do get a significant flare of their symptoms, but I don't think this equates um, to growth acceleration. Um, I think it's important to bear in mind that this drug on this schedule remains uh, a standard treatment, as you've heard, for this disease. And I think this is quite a provocative study, um, the, the EFFECT trial. Um, and all it was doing, very simply, was looking at a lower continuous dose of sunitinib, so that's the same way that most of the other drugs are given, versus a higher intermittent dose. So that the higher intermittent dose is the standard schedule, 50 milligrams for four weeks on, then two weeks off. 37.5 continuous, if you work it out on the back of an envelope, given continuously, um, equates to pretty much the same amount of drug into the patients. So this is a, a large randomized phase two trial, almost 300 patients. And interestingly, and I'm not aware of a p-value for this, um, you could actually get more drug into the patients, that's 91% on the intermittent schedule than you could on the continuous schedule. And we know that dose is important in this disease. In other words, the more you can dose, the greater the chance of efficacy. But the median time to progression in the bottom bullet point um, was almost 10 months, according to the intermittent schedule, versus seven months um, on the continuous schedule. Now, if that had been two different drugs, I suspect a lot of medical oncologists would have been getting pretty excited about that, and someone would have been setting up a large randomized trial. But the fact of the matter is it wasn't two drugs. It was two different schedules of the same drug. And OK, the p-value is 0.09, so it's not statistically significant. But I think that's a, a very interesting observation. So final slide. Um, so can we truly intermittently treat the patients? Um, a, a trial called STAR, which Janet Brown from Leeds is leading, um, is investigating this. And the way this works is you have your standard schedule of sunitinib, 
um, where you keep going until the patient progresses versus stopping it at maximum response and then restarting it when the patient progresses. I think this is an interesting idea, but I think yet again, the problem's going to be that it might be okay for some patients, but it clearly won't be okay for others. And without a better understanding of the disease, I think it will be very, very difficult to select the right patients for this approach. Thank you very much.